Uh, gracious God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for those who are there, here today and those uh, uh, who are still on their way. Do pray for a safe trip. And thank you for your blessings. And do pray, Lord, for clarity of thought as we discuss an important topic today. Uh, so give us insight, give us understanding, give us wisdom, and teach us, Lord. Uh, for your glory, we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, for those who don't know, my name is Michael Weiss. Uh, I work here at Zion's Hope, one of the Bible teachers, but I also hit up social media, and we have a YouTube page, Facebook, and Twitter, just to remind you. Uh, so if you are on, online, go ahead and check us out, like us, and follow us, and all that fun stuff. Uh, I have been doing a series on biblical interpretation, and today is going to be the last in this series. Today we're talking about interpreting Revelation as Jewish apocalyptic literature. Uh, again, I know that's a mouthful. It is something we're going to be covering a lot today. It is a lot of information, and in all honesty, this really is the most difficult style of writing to interpret. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of discipline, a lot of study. Uh, and that's one reason why there's so many different interpretations of Revelation. I mean, you, if you just look at church history, there's just so many ideas and perspectives and uh, end times this, they say this, they well, what about this, well, what about this? And it just is like, what do you do, where do you start sometimes? And really, one session is not enough to really do this justice. Uh, but in part 10, uh, this is what I'm hoping to cover. I hope this is going to be helpful. I don't want to confuse you. I know that's a possibility. I, I pray that that won't happen. Uh, but I do want to encourage you to keep studying this form, this style of literature. So first, we have to define our terms. What is Jewish apocalyptic literature? This is something that a lot of people are not familiar with. I'm just going to quote here uh, from a book, uh, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation, and this is a good overview. Apocalyptic describes prophecies in which God, quote, reveals his hidden future plans, usually through dreams or visions with elaborate and at times strange symbolism or numbers. The form of apocalyptic, i.e. dreams, vision symbols, makes it makes his communication less direct than the spoken word of prophecy proper. This explains in part why it poses such an interpretive challenge. More important, apocalyptic has a unique view of God's relationship with human history. Rather than work within it, the apocalyptic God radically intervenes from outside it. The events of human history had plunged them, that is Israel, into such despair that they doubted whether God still controlled it. And you know what? Sometimes in our life we feel the same way. When things feel out of control, Lord, are you in control still? Do you still care? Do you still love me? In such despair, they did out of whether God still controlled it. In reply, apocalyptic held out hope of God's sovereign intervention beyond history, an intervention so radical as to usher in an utterly new era. Now, ultimately, within the Jewish perspective, they're looking for the Messianic kingdom, the Messianic era, which is still yet to come. But there's a few principles when it comes to looking just in general at apocalyptic literature I just want to go over very quickly. And you have those on your outline. First of all, judgment. Now in prophecy, as we've studied, uh, there's a, a call for repentance. There's, a, there, there's an opportunity for change. But in apocalyptic literature, judgment is inevitable. It's going to happen no matter what. You cannot stop it. It's going to occur. Second. People's desire for God's intervention. Now, in prophecy, the focus is on God's displeasure with evil. But in apocalyptic writings, people are so displeased with evil. They're so sick of evil. Lord, do something. Please intervene. Change this. Work in the lives of these individuals. Just, just go at it, Lord, and do whatever you got to do. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Third, God's call for the faithful to persevere. This is very important within Jewish apocalyptic literature. In prophecy, God says, repent. And we see that all throughout the prophets. The prophets were again calling them back to covenant faithfulness. Come back to the Lord. Come back to what you promised you would do and who you would be. But in apocalyptic writings, God says, you know what? Judgment's coming. You who are faithful, persevere. Remain faithful. Keep being faithful. Then number four, supernatural intervention. Now, prophecy can include this, but it also includes natural and human intervention. But apocalyptic writings refer to specific supernatural intervention by God, whether it's an angel or God himself or a mixture thereof. Again, a general principle, symbolism. There's a lot of symbolism in apocalyptic writing. 
In prophecy, God speaks directly to his people of the nations. Thus saith the Lord. God says this, 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 and this. Do this, do this, do this. In apocalyptic literature, there's a lot of symbolism, indirect speech. There's visions about certain things that unless you really understand, you're not going to know what's going on. Kind of like hidden code in some sense. And that brings us to number six, numbers. Numbers. Prophecy can use numbers for very important things. It's very significant when it comes to apocalyptic literature as well, because numbers are really not a major part of prophecy. But again, for apocalyptic literature, this is kind of decoding the meaning of some of the phrases. Uh, this again is based upon the Jewish number system related to the Hebrew alphabet called gematria. Now, I'm gonna be honest, most of what you hear about this today is nonsense. It is bogus. You really have to go back and understand what is going on in the first century or, the, or whenever the, the text was written, whatever you're studying, by the way. But when you read the book of Revelation, numbers are very significant. And we'll look at some of those here in just a little bit. Uh, so just be, be careful of this and be aware of this. Um, I'll talk more about this here in just a few minutes. Number seven, cosmic events. Cosmic events. Prophecy is focused on imminent, that is what's coming soon, and future events. But apocalyptic literature really is talking about events from a cosmic perspective, a final perspective. Everything is going up to this point, and boom, that's when it happens. So there's about seven general principles when it comes to Jewish apocalyptic literature. Now, with that in mind, and you've probably already started connecting some of the dots, we're going to look at what books in Scripture are considered apocalyptic literature. What books in Scripture are considered Jewish apocalyptic literature? And there's actually a few. Daniel. <clears throat> now, in the Jewish canon, it's actually history. But for us, of course, we understand that there is prophecy. But also, there's apocalyptic images and pictures and symbolism and words used here. Also, in Isaiah 24 through 27, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Joel 2, 28 through 3, 21, we talk about the day of the Lord. You know, these cosmic disturbances, that's apocalyptic writing. Zechariah 1 through 6 and Zechariah 9 through 14, most of the book of Zechariah is apocalyptic style writing. Also, Matthew 24 and 25 kind of picks up on some of those elements, particularly from Joel and, and of course, others, others as well. And then, of course, we think of the book of Revelation. This is the main one in the New Testament that is apocalyptic style literature. But we also need to recognize that within the Jewish community, the Bible is not the only book or book of books that contains apocalyptic writing. There's actually quite a bit outside of Scripture. A couple of them, for Ezra, 2 Baruch, or 1 Enoch. Now, th these are all styles of writing that were known to the Jews in that day, you know, or, or afterwards too. So you know, the book of Revelation is not unique in that sense. And you read the second Baruch, and there's actually a lot of parallels in the way everything opens. But that brings us to interpreting the book of Revelation. Interpreting the book of Revelation. And of course, this is where we're going to spend most of our time here. Now, when we look at Revelation, we need to understand that it's actually a mixture of three genres. It's not just apocalyptic. First of all, it is prophetic. It says it, chapter 1, verse 3. 19, 10, and 22, 18, and 19. It calls itself a prophecy. But it's also a letter to seven churches. Chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, and 22, verse 21. But then also, it is Jewish apocalyptic literature. We see that in verse 1 of chapter 1. The revelation, the apocalypsis, the unveiling. So we have this revelation uh, as... Jewish apocalyptic literature, it's also a letter and it's prophecy. So we should expect to have a mixture of things within this book. And that's actually what we do see. Because it refers to things in the first century, but also looks forward to the end. Now, when it comes to the book of Revelation, there's actually four, some say five basic views. The first one is the preterist view. How many have ever heard of preterism? Ever heard of preterism? Okay. Basically, they say every event up to Revelation 19 has already taken place. Now, they believe this was written before 70 AD, before the fall of Jerusalem. They still say, well, the return of Jesus is still yet future and the judgment is still yet future. But there's also a group called full preterism, which says that Jesus has already returned. Now, I would disagree with the first, but the, the second is actually a heretical view because Jesus has not returned yet. I mean, just look around. It, it hasn't happened yet. 
Second, there's the idealist view. It says, well, Revelation is symbolic and represents the struggle between good and evil that has always been around. Okay, there's good and evil in there and there's a struggle, but that's the idealist view. Then there's the historicist view. They say, well, Revelation represents a picture of the entire church age. Well, it's an overview of the major events, you know, from the first century to the return of Christ. And you, you, know, you can kind of sort of see certain things and persecution, you know, the rise and fall of empires and things like that. Then there is the futurist view. And the, they say most of the revelation still has yet to be fulfilled. And there's, of course, many different subgroups within the futurist view. We will not get into that. Now, I myself, I, I do hold to a futurist view, but I do think we also need to keep the context of the first century. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes uh, because we need to recognize that as well. <clears throat> because I do believe that some go too far with some of those things in the futurist view. We do need to remember, as I mentioned, that this was a letter written to seven churches in the first century. This was not written to us in the 21st century. Is it for us? Absolutely. Can we learn from it? Absolutely. But we need to remember and first recognize, okay, I cannot deny that John wrote this roughly about 95 AD, because if I do, I'm taking it out of its historical context. However, if I deny the future events, I'm taking it out of its prophetic and apocalyptic context. So again, we have a mixture here that we need to keep in mind. And there can be actually multiple fulfillments of things. If you were here when I talked about interpreting prophecy, that is something that is very common because the Jewish mindset does not look at history in a linear fashion. It's cyclical. It's cyclical. It goes in a circle. Re history repeats itself in one sense within their understanding. It doesn't deny that you know, they're coming towards the end, of course, but that's just the way they would view history in that time. For those of us who study Revelation for years or if you're just starting to study this book, here's some principles when it comes to studying Revelation specifically, I hope it will be helpful for you. So first of all, focus on the main things. Don't get lost in the details. The horns and this and this and the toes and the hair and the head and, the, and, and who is this and what is this? Focus first on the big picture. And then as you learn more, as you study, then go look at more of the details and try and figure some of those out. Because what is the goal of interpretation? The goal is to get back to what the original writer meant. Not what we think we want it to mean, but what he meant when he wrote it. Second, remember the symbolism. Don't be too literal with the symbols. Now we know Daniel in, 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 in writings you know, talks about the beasts, the leopard and the, and, and the bear and everything. He's not talking about literal animals. You say, well, we wouldn't say that. Well, believe it or not, there are a lot of people who do use these symbols and get way too literal with them, and they go way off on left field. If you studied anything in prophecy over the past hundred years or so, you understand what I'm saying. It happens a lot. Now, symbolism does refer to something literal, but be careful about that. And when John gives the symbol its own interpretation, when he says, this is what this means, that's where you start. We'll mention a few things here in a little bit. You know, the, the seven churches are this. These seven messengers are this. Okay, start there, and then from what you do understand, try and figure out what he doesn't specifically define. That's a basic principle of interpretation. Start with what is basic and easy to understand, and then go to the more difficult texts to try to figure them out. Same principle here. And remember the symbols as whole pictures, kind of like parables. We talked about parables a, a few sessions ago. Then... Going with this, compare scripture with scripture. Remember, in prophecy, there can be multiple fulfillments, and Revelation has aspects of this too. But also, number four, this is something we don't often think about. Remember the pastoral concern. Well, what does that mean? One purpose of apocalyptic literature was to encourage the persecuted to persevere. I've already mentioned this. And if you have done any study with any organization or ministry that deal with persecuted Christians overseas, you learn that one of, the, one of the favorite books they have is the book of Revelation. Now, they don't understand every detail. They don't really understand how some of those things fit together. But in summary, they understand the purpose of the book of Revelation in two words, God wins. And they recognize we're being persecuted just like it refers to here in this book but God's going to bring everything to a point in history where he's going to win. 
and I'm on his side. Therefore, it gives me courage, gives me strength to persevere when my family hates me, when the government is after me, when the military is trying to kill me. So when you're in a persecuted situation, you look at this a little bit different than we do here in the West where we have, where, when we are at ease in Zion. So remember the pastoral concern when it comes to this book. Number five, know the Old Testament. Know the Old Testament. You cannot understand the book of Revelation without a working knowledge of the Old Testament. It is impossible. There are over 250 references, directly or indirectly, in the book of Revelation from the Old Testament, particularly the prophetic books, Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, but also Genesis and other places too. And we'll look at a few of those things here again in just a little bit. So you will misinterpret this book if you neglect this fact and you forget that this is referring to the Old Testament and those who are assumed to know the Old Testament. And this imagery, the symbolism, often reflects on a Jewish background from an Old Testament perspective. Number six, application comes from the main points. So be careful about trying to apply every detail. That's just, a, just a, an encouragement there. Number seven, beware of hype. Beware of hype. And if you've been a Christian for any number of years and been studying prophecy for any number of years, you know that this has been a problem for centuries. For centuries because there has been and continues to be a lot of harmful interpretations of Revelation be careful of people or ministries who say well I've unlocked everything in the book of Revelation I understand all of it yeah probably not <laughs> now one thing I appreciate about Zion's hope we're trying to do our best to learn about these things we don't have it all figured out yet and again, this was written in the first century to the people in the first century about what was happening then and going to happen beyond the first century into the time of the return of Christ. But beware of the hype. Don't get caught up in that because it does happen a lot. And there's a lot of cults that do the same thing. You know, remember the Jehovah's Witnesses, 144,000, they're going to heaven. Uh, that's not what the text says, nor what it means. So be careful. Number eight, interpreting numbers. I mentioned this a few minutes ago. Numbers, again, are very important in Jewish apocalyptic literature, particularly 4, 7, 12, 1,000, and numbers related to those are very significant. I'll give you a few examples here. There are seven churches, and seven is a number of completion or perfection within Jewish uh, understanding. There's also three cycles of seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. There's a beast with seven heads, a city on seven hills. 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, or the 12 tribes. See that in chapter 7, we see that in chapter 14. Five months of locusts or demons, chapter 9, verse 5. Ten days of persecution for the Smyrna church in 210. Now, some of these numbers are literal, some are symbolic. The hard part is saying, okay, which one's which? Uh, that's where the context comes in. And sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes it is difficult. And last, and here's where we can all be comforted. No one is going to get it right all until the end. No one's going to get everything right until the end. As good as some teachers are, there are still elements no one is going to really understand until just prior to the return of Christ. That's just the way it is. But we do our best until that time. Now, let's come to a general outline and overview of Revelation. And before we get to this, uh, I just want to remind you that one style of Jewish writing was to give an overview and then to go back in and fill the details. Very common in Scripture. One example is Genesis 1 and 2. Not two different accounts of creation. Genesis 1 gives you the overall summary of Genesis or days 1 through 6, and then chapter 2 focuses in on day 6. So it's just a style of writing. We see that a lot here in Revelation with what we're calling interludes. The interludes. The interludes. So, with that said, first of all, we have chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. This is the prologue. Revelation, again, the unveiling. This is how we know it's apocalyptic literature. So it's from God to Jesus through an angel to John. So we have a, this whole pattern taking place. Verse 3 tells us this is a prophecy. Verse 4 says this is a letter. Again, this is how we know it's a mixture of genres within this book. Wonderful book, too, by the way. And I do want to encourage you to, to read it and, and study it more. Next, 
9 through 20, chapter 1, this is a vision of Jesus among the churches. Remember, John is in exile on this prison island of Patmos, a desolate place at that time. Why? Because of his faithfulness to Christ. He tells us that. He needs to write what he saw about the things which are, which will be, and the things which are still yet future. And he sees Jesus walking among the seven lampstands, which is actually a picture of a menorah. And then there's this vivid picture, this description of Jesus as a high priest given in these chapters, but also a judge. So it's a mixture of, of symbols there too. Then we learn the meaning of these symbols. Well, the seven stars, what are they? Seven messengers. Now there's, you know, angels or pastors, there's discussion on that. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. You see that in chapter 1, verse 20. And then John talks about these letters here in 2, 1 through 3, 22. These are the letters to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, or Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The order, this is very interesting, the order that is given here in, this chap, in these chapters is the order that the letter would have been carried in Asia Minor starting in Ephesus, then to Smyrna, and then just going around in kind of a circle almost. In each letter, <clears throat> there is a specific characteristic of Jesus highlighted. I'm the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega. I'm the one who sees everything. So there's a characteristic that that church needed to hear about, that needed to understand that aspect of God's character, of Christ's character. Then there's a commendation, an accusation, then an exhortation and warning and or encouragement to listen. Listen. Heed what the Word says. Heed what is being written here. Let me just read you a couple of those. Mm -hmm. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And hearing in the Jewish mind is not just, okay, I hear you. No, it's action is involved in that too. Now, of course, we know there's a couple of churches that don't have any common condemnation too, you know, because they're, they're persecuted in a whole lot more. But then we come to chapter 4, and this is where things start to become controversial. This is where the differences start to come into place when it comes to the views on end times. Here we have the heavenly throne room. We have the Lamb and the seven-sealed scroll. And, of course, Marv and Dave have done a lot of teaching on that. You can go back online on our YouTube page and look at all those videos. Now, from earth, the scene changes to heaven. John is told to come up. Now, this is not a reference to the rapture. If you believe that, I'm, I'm sorry, but that is not what this text is talking about. John is told to come up here. I'm going to show you some things, John. And he sees God the Father being worshipped on his throne. There's these four living creatures, these angels, surrounding the throne. And then there's the seven spirits of God and the 24 elders. So we have two times 12. And... The Father is holding a scroll in his right hand, written on both sides. And again, we've done a lot of stuff on that. And no one is worthy to, find, to, to open the scroll, let alone even touch the scroll. And what does John do? He weeps. Until he sees the Lamb, Jesus. He is worthy. He's worthy to take the scroll and to begin breaking open those seals, all of them on the outside. And then... One thing you'll find in Revelation, there's a lot of worship going on. There's a whole lot of praise taking place. And this is the first time we see worship just breaks out in heaven. And I think that's one important aspect for those of us who are going through tough times. When is the hardest time for us to praise God? When we're going through difficulty. When we're going through persecution. I read a... Uh, like a blog article from a persecuted Christian over in, in, in Asia. Uh, she sings a lot. And basically she said, you know, when I was in prison, you know, I didn't have a Bible or had very limited access to Scripture, you know, the verses I would remember. The way that the Lord helped me to be encouraged was through song. So I sang and I sang and I sang and I sang. And an individual heard this now at that time, an older woman singing outside and he was discouraged and she sang to him and they started singing together and he was encouraged also. And he asked her, why did you do this? He's like, because it's, it encourages my spirit. And you'll find in the Revelation a lot of worship taking place. And this is one time here in these verses when you see it taking place. But then again, we come to chapter 6. Verses 1 through 17, this is where the first six seals are popped open. So Jesus begins to open these seals on the scroll. 
And of course, parallel in Matthew 24. The first seal, there's a conqueror on the white horse, not referring to Christ. Second seal, there's conflict on the earth. There's a red horse. Third seal, scarcity on the earth. There's a black horse. Fourth seal, death on the earth. There's this pale or green horse or ashen horse, depending upon your translation. Then there's the sixth seal, the silence before the wrath. If you have your Bibles or your phones, go to Revelation 6. I just want to read this uh, to you real quick here. Revelation chapter 6. I want to read this uh, seal to you. Verses 12 through 17, only a few verses. And I looked when he, who is he? Jesus, the Lamb. When he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and Mike Ufferman has talked about the earthquakes. The sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. So no matter who you are, no matter what status you are, you're going to run. And they, who is they? The ones who are running, the kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, all these individuals. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? God's wrath did not occur before the seal. So this is getting ready for God's judgment to take place, for God's wrath to be poured out on the world. But we see this apocalyptic language for God's wrath here. The, the sky being folded up like a scroll, a fig tree you know, being shaken. The sun became black as sackcloth. The, the, the moon became like blood. That goes back to Joel. Matthew 24 also. And so we see this massive imagery, again, quoting Joel 2.31, by the way, and Matthew 24.29. This is a cosmic event taking place here. Then we come to chapter 17, or chapter 7, rather. This is the first interlude. Now, again, just to remind you, these things took place, but in the meantime, here's some other things that are going, going to take place as well. We see this, the sealing of the 144,000 Jews and the multitude out of the Great Tribulation. While the other events are taking place, other things are going to occur at that time. God seals these 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. That is the remnant that God always has. You see that principle all throughout Scripture too. There's a great multitude in heaven. They're not on earth, they're in heaven. These are those who came out or were killed during the Great Tribulation. And here's the thing. Here's what brings comfort to those who are persecuted. They are with the Lord and they no longer hunger, they no longer thirst, and they will be comforted. What a great verse for those who are hungry, running, thirsty, and in pain, or being tortured for their faith. To know that someday they will not thirst anymore. They will not hunger anymore. Their pain will be gone, and God himself is going to be their comforter. So that is encouragement, not only for those then, but of course now and in the future too. Then we come to chapter 8. And nine, now the seventh seal is opened and the sounding of the first six trumpets take place. So there's silence in heaven for 30 minutes uh, before God's wrath begins and before these trumpet judgments. That actually goes back to Zechariah 2.3 and Zephaniah 1.7, referring back to, okay, be still before the Lord. The day of the Lord has come. And it's also God's answer to the persecutor. Remember what was their question? How long, O oh Lord? Before you revenge our blood. How long, Lord? He says, just a little bit longer until the rest are killed, just like you. But this is God's answer. And then the trumpet judgments, which are actually related to those in Egypt, there's some parallels there if you go back and study the Exodus, start to take place. Now, like the seals, there's this four plus two plus one pattern or structure. Well, the first four trumpets, just like the first four seals, target the physical earth. And the second set of two trumpets target humanity. Then the one is kind of like a, a pause. You know, the, the, the seventh seal is a pause. The seventh trumpet is a pause. 
getting ready for the bowls. So we see that pattern here. And then we also see that the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are also called the three woes. Now, you probably know this, but just as a reminder, a woe in prophetic literature or prophetic scripture is a judgment. What did Jesus say to the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23? Woe! Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Hypocrites! Remember what Isaiah said to himself? Woe is me, for I am undone. That's a pronouncement of judgment. And here God is judging the world. And the fifth and sixth trumpets are also involve demonic activity. You see that too. Then in chapter 10 and 11, this is a second interlude. So this is taking place. Here's some other things. There's a mighty angel, a little book, and two witnesses. Now this mighty angel descends from heaven with a little scroll. That goes back to Ezekiel 2 and 3. John eats the scroll, just like Ezekiel did, and then he's given a reed, this measuring rod or measuring stick to measure the temple which is interesting because by 95 AD, the temple didn't exist on the earth. It had already been destroyed. So this tells me that something's gonna happen in the future with regards to a building of a temple of some kind. But we also read about two witnesses. Now they're referenced from Zechariah 4 and they have power like Moses and Elijah. But then we also read the Gentiles are gonna tread the holy city. What city is that? Jerusalem. And these two witnesses are going to prophesy for 42 months, three and a half years. But then these two witnesses are killed. Then they come back to life, and of course the whole world's like, whoa. And then the second woe is done, because again, that again refers to the trumpet. Then in 11, 15 through 19, the seventh trumpet sounds, and again, praise is given. And it says, the kingdoms of this world have become those belonging to the Lord and His Christ. And again, we see praise taking place. Then in chapters 12 through 14, we have the third interlude. So while all that's taken place, here's some other things. Chapter 12, the woman and the dragon. The woman is, of course, Israel. That goes back to Genesis 37 and Joseph's dream. This woman is in labor. There's this dragon. He's got seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems are crowned on his heads. And we know the dragon, of course, is a reference to Satan because the text tells us. And this woman is travailing to give birth to the child Jesus. And then this woman runs. War breaks out in heaven. Satan and his army are thrown to the earth. And the heavens are called to rejoice. But sorry, earth, you need to be ready because he's coming down and he's not very happy. And then what does the dragon do? He persecutes Israel and something else. Turn to chapter 12. Now, I hope you see kind of a progression, too, of the book of Revelation. So Satan is thrown to the earth. Chapter 12. Now, let's go back up to verse 14. 13, rather. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now, of course, the, the woman is who? Israel. Good. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman. Again, here's you know, a visual apocalyptic imagery here so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she will be nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Dragon, same thing. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away in the flood. Verse 16. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. And verse 17 of chapter 12. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, and went off to make war with the rest of her children. Well, who is that? Well, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Who is this? Christians. Believers. This is the church. So for those who say the church isn't mentioned after the early chapters, this is one reference where it is. So here we have Satan not only warring against the Jews, Israel, but also those who are faithful to Jesus. We will call them Christians. So this is taking place at this time. Then chapter 13, we have two beasts. The beast from the nations, or the sea, and the beast from the earth. And John sees this beast arise from the sea. Now that the sea is a reference to the nations. Seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns, described as a leopard, a bear, 
and a lion. And of course, we know that goes back to Daniel 7. One of its heads is wounded and healed, and then, of course, that is worshipped. Authority was given to him over all the earth. Of course, God has ultimate authority. He gives it to this individual, this empire, this beast. But then another beast arises from the earth. And this false prophet, beast, does miracles. He deceives people into making this image of the beast. And somehow he gives this image life. And tells people, worship this beast. And creates this mark of the beast. Now, depending upon which manuscript you look at, it is 666 or 616. There is some scholarly debate about that. We'll just go with 666 because it's the most familiar to us. But that is important to understand that too. So here's this taking place. So this mark of the beast is not going to occur until well into what we call Daniel's 70th week, by the way. So those who are trying to hype it up, oh, this is going to be the mark. Well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Chapter 14. Then we have the lamb, 144,000 once again, three angels and two reapings. A lot, of a lot is going on here in this chapter, by the way. So John sees this 144,000 now standing on Mount Zion with the lamb. An angel is flying in heaven, urging people, worship God. A second angel says, Babylon is fallen. A third angel says, don't take the mark of the beast or you're going to be judged then there's a blessing pronounced on those who die from now on in the Lord. Then there's two reapings at the end of the chapter. Then chapter 15 and 16. There's a prelude or kind of a preparation. And then the seven bowls of wrath are the seven bowls of judgment. So again, we do see this progression. There's a lot of other events taking place. John sees another angel with seven last plagues is what it's called there in the text. Bowls or vials of God's wrath. And remember, this, these are kind of like flat, almost flat bowls. Not like a bowl that we have. In these, the text says, God's wrath is complete. It is finished. More worship takes place. Again, we have it there. And these seven angels are preparing to pour out God's wrath in the bowl judgments, and these occur very rapidly. The trumpets, there's some time that goes by between those, but these are done very quickly. And in chapter 17 and through 19, we have another interlude. <laughs> so again, there's a lot of things that, here's what's going on, pause. Here's other things that are taking place during that same time. Interlude for the woman and the fall of Babylon the Great. One angel shows John a woman and a beast. She has seven heads and ten horns. She's Babylon the Great. And there's some symbols defined in chapter 17, 9 through 18. We'll just look at a few of these here. 17, 9 through 18. Here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and another is yet to come. So five have already taken place in history. One is, that was Rome, one is yet to come. When he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not, he himself is an eighth of one of the seven. You can go back and study that in your own time. <laughs> and he goes into destruction. The 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who've not yet received the kingdom but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour, so there's another number, a short time. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome him. Why? Because he's Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's how we know what the water means. And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these, are, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked. So there's this battle between the government and the religion. And will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God be fulfilled. The woman which you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Pause on that thought for a second. Chapter 18 talks about the fall of Babylon the Great. A lament by the unjust. Oh, no, it's so sad. And a celebration by the just. Yes, God's taken judgment and done judgment on these people for its fall. Then 19 through 21. Generally speaking, in the return of Jesus, defeat of his enemies, he returns on a white horse that was symbolic of victory. In that day, that was very clear symbolism. There's the wedding supper of the Lamb. And Jesus takes the beast and the false prophet, throws him in the lake of fire, and kills his enemies, of course, with the sword. Chapter 20, 
1 through 15, the thousand year reign, defeat of Satan's armies, a white throne judgment. Again, a lot of takes place in these verses here. Satan is bound, Christ rules for a thousand years. Afterwards, Satan is released, deceives the nations. He tries to take over again. Think about that. Some of us never learn. <laughs> He tries to take over. Fire destroys the, the, the rebellious army, and Satan's cast into the lake of fire, finally. Then the white throne judgment takes place. The death, then death and Hades are cast also into the lake of fire. Then we come to 22 through 25, or 21 through 22, verse 5. The new heavens, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Those take place. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven as a beautiful city. There's a restored Eden, and the curse of sin has been removed. Wow, I can't wait for that. Then 22, 6 through 21, that's an epilogue. There's also an offer. Come, come, come to Jesus. A blessing and a warning. Christ is going to return, bring his reward with him. And his reward is judgment or blessing, depending upon who you are, depending upon what you've done with Jesus. And there's a plea to come to Christ and a warning. Don't take away or add to what is written in this prophecy. Important. So there's just kind of a basic overview of Revelation. And I know that was a lot. I'm sure your head is swimming. Um, <laughs> but uh, just kind of a, a quick conclusion here to kind of wrap some of this up. We need to remember this was written to seven churches in the first century, Asia Minor. The text had to have application to them. And I, I am a futurist. I do hold to a pre-wrath view, pre-millennial, all that. But it had to have application to those who read this in the first century and the centuries after that, too. This does refer to Rome in John's day. I'll give you one example here. They persecuted Jews and Christians. This is a coin of Emperor Vespasian and the goddess Roma. What is she sitting on? Seven hills. It's right there. I mean, it's, it's John was writing this against Rome in his day. But keep thinking, keep listening. Because we're not, we're not done there. We're not done yet. Revelation, some say, may also refer to the crumbling of the empire and the barbarian invasion, which actually did take place in 410 AD. That's possible. Because when, and when the Jewish readers would have read the book of Revelation, when they saw this 666, they would have thought of Nero. Because in the Hebrew alphabet, his name adds up to 666. That's just the way it is. Again, using gematria. And like Babylon, which we also see in Revelation, Nero became a prototype of a deified person. Because don't forget, the, the Roman emperors were deified. They were worshipped as gods. Just like the future Antichrist will try to do too. And Revelation, yes, was written against Rome, but an encouragement for those followers of Christ then to persevere, saying, oh, God's going to intervene. However... Those events were shadows of what is also going to take place in the future. Because remember, prophecy goes over and over again. And some of those details in Revelation didn't take place yet. They haven't taken place yet. And as prophetic literature, the events of Revelation still speak to future events, the day of the Lord um, and the overthrow of Rome is a picture of the greater overthrow of mystery Babylon in the future. You say, well, it's Rome. It doesn't have to be Rome. And it can't be Rome because the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. Roman Catholicism didn't exist in the first century, by the way, either. The challenge of prophetic literature is that, again, there is more than one fulfillment. And I do believe that Islam is going to be a major player in end times. And while there is some historical application to some of the events that Christians faced in the early centuries when this was written, there are future events that will be fulfilled, just as the book of Revelation says. There is an antichrist coming. There is a false prophet coming. There is the mark of the beast coming. There will be some kind of temple rebuilt. There will be a one world government, one world religion, and there will be a call to worship the beast who is empowered by Satan. He will persecute Jews and Christians during the great tribulation. Jesus will return in victory to judge the living and the dead to set up his kingdom, to rule from Jerusalem, fulfill God's promises to Israel, and after that 1,000 years, cast Satan, death, and Hades in the lake of fire, and then everything will be fine.
for eternity. And what do we say? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I know this was a lot, but um, I do hope it was helpful to you. Again, a summary of the book of Revelation, but also a reminder it had to have meaning to them, but it also has meaning to us today and will in the future. So keep studying the book of Revelation. Keep studying it. And uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer, and then I'll have a couple of announcements. Let's, let's pray. Uh, gracious God, our Father, we do thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, I know that this was a lot to think about, a lot to consider. Uh, but Lord, we also know that those things that are written in the book of Revelation have not been fully fulfilled yet, but will be fulfilled right before the return of Christ. So we do look forward to the things which are going to take place. We know that we need to be prepared, that persecution is happening now, and it will happen in an even greater way in the future, even in the West. So Lord, let us not be deceived, but let us be prepared. And let us take comfort in knowing that even if we don't understand any or every detail of the book of Revelation, we know that you win. You will be victorious through Christ. And because we are in Christ, we will be victorious with him. So, Father, I do pray for the persecuted church around the world today. And I do pray, Lord, for us that you prepare us for what is coming. So we commit this to you. We thank you. We love you. And we praise you, Lord. And all this we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.